There was a lot of communication, again, once again, from your senior staff, from the State Department, to you or from you in 2011. And in fact, that is when Gaddafi fell. He fell in 2011. But then, when we go to 2012, Libya, Benghazi, Chris Stevens, the staff there, they, they seem to fall off your radar in 2012, and the situation's getting much worse in 2012. It was getting much worse. And let me just share for you, in your records mm -hmm. that we have reviewed, there is not one email to you or from you in 2012 when an explosive device went off at our compound in April. There's not a single email in your records about that explosive device. So my question is, this was a very important mission in 2011. You sent Chris Stevens there, but yet when our compound is attacked in 2012, what kind of culture was created in the State Department that your folks couldn't tell you in an email about a bomb in April of 2012? Well, Congresswoman, I did not conduct most of the business that I did on behalf of uh, our country on email. I conducted it in meetings. I read uh, massive amounts of memos, a great deal of classified information. I made a lot of secure phone calls. I was in and out of the White House all the time. There were a lot of things that happened that uh, I was aware of and that I was reacting to. If you were to be in my office in the State Department, I didn't have a computer. I did not do the vast majority of my work on email, and I bet there's a lot of Sid Blumenthal's emails in there from 2011, too. Well, we'll and so I think later. that there were, I don't want you to have a mistaken impression about what I did and how I did it. Most of my work was not done on emails with my closest aides, with officials in the State Department, officials in the rest of the government, as well as the White House and people uh, around the world. And, and thank you for sharing that, because I'm sure that it's not all done on emails, Madam Secretary. And there are meetings and there are discussions. And so then when our compound took a second attack on June 6th, when a bomb blew a wall through the compound then, no emails, no emails at all. But I am interested in knowing who were you meeting with, who were you huddling with, how were you informed about those things, because there is nothing in the emails that talks about two significant attacks on our compounds in 2012. I, there I was a lot of information in 2011 about issues and security posture, and yet nothing in 2012. Well, I'd be happy to explain. Every morning when I arrived at the State Department, usually between 8 and 8.30, I had a personal one-on-one -on -one briefing from uh, the representative of the Central Intelligence Agency who shared with me uh, the uh, highest level of classified information that uh, I was uh, to be aware of on a daily basis. I then had a meeting with the top officials of the State Department every day that I was in town. That's where a lot of information, including uh, threats and attacks on our facilities was shared. I also had a weekly meeting every Monday with all of the uh, officials, the assistant secretaries and others, so that I could be brought up to date on any issue that they were concerned about. During the day, I received hundreds of pages of memos, many of them classified, some of them so top secret that they were brought into my office in a locked briefcase that I had to read and immediately return to the courier. And I was constantly at the White House in the Situation Room, meeting with the National Security Advisor and others. I would also be meeting with officials in the State Department, foreign officials and others. So there was a lot going on during every day. I did not email during the day, um, and except on rare occasions when I was able to, but I didn't conduct the business that I did primarily on email. That is not how I gathered information, assessed information, asked the hard questions uh, of the people that I worked with. It appears that leaving Benghazi, with respect to all of that danger, leaving Benghazi was not an option in 2012, and I yield back. Uh, well, if, I, if, if I could just quickly respond, there was never a recommendation from any intelligence uh, official in our government from any official in the State Department or from any other uh, person with knowledge of our presence in Benghazi to shut down Benghazi, even after uh, the two attacks that uh, the compound suffered. And perhaps, uh, you know, you would wonder why, but I can tell you that it was thought that the mission in Benghazi, in conjunction with the CIA mission, was vital to our national interests. 
Gentlelake of Indiana yields back. The chair will now re briefly recognize Mr. Cummings and then Ms. Duckworth. Thank you, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to clarify, when I was uh, asking Secretary Clinton a question a moment ago, I mentioned an email that had gone from Ambassador Chris Stevens to Deputy Secretary Lamb. What I meant to say was a, a, a cable. And I just wanted to make sure the record was clear. The record will reflect that. Uh, Ms. Duckworth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Clinton, I'm pleased that you finally have the opportunity to be here. Um, before I start my line of questioning, I just want to clarify um, with regards to the April-June 2012 incidents, um, I believe that the procedure that the State Department had for these types of incidents was to actually um, hold uh, uh, what are called emergency action committee hearings on the ground immediately. And in fact, there were at least five on the records for June alone um, uh, in, on the ground in both Tripoli and Benghazi, and that is the correct procedure for handling such instances. Is that not correct? That's correct. Thank you. Secretary Clinton, um, my focus uh, and my job on this committee is to make sure that we never put brave Americans like Ambassador Stevens, Sean Smith, Tyrone Woods, and Glenn Doherty ever on the ground again anywhere in the world uh, without the protection that they so rightly deserve. Uh, having flown um, combat missions myself and in, in some dangerous places, um, I understand the dedication of our men and women who choose to serve this country or, uh, overseas. Uh, I have a special affinity for the diplomatic corps because these are folks who go in without the benefit of weapons, uh, without the benefit of military might, armed only with America's values and diplomatic words and a handshake to forward our um, na na nation's interests globally. Um, so I am absolutely determined to make sure that we safeguard, in the name of our heroic dead, um, our men and women in the diplomatic corps, wherever they are around the world. So the bottom line for me, I'm, I'm a very mission-driven person, the bottom line for me is um, with respect to examining what went wrong in Benghazi is clear. Let's learn from those mistakes and let's figure out what we need to do to fix them. Uh, I've only been in Congress not quite three years, almost three years. Um, and in this time, I've actually served on two other committees in addition to this one that has looked at the Benghazi attacks, both armed services and oversight and government reform. Uh, so I've had a chance to really look at all of these documents. Um, one of the things that I saw, um, and I'd like you to uh, discuss this with you, is that um, the Department of State and the Department of the Defense at the time seems to have not had the most ideal cooperation uh, when it came to threat or security analysis. Um, uh, I do know, however, that um, over the past decade, they've established a tradition of working together on the ground in dangerous regions that has increased over time. Um, however, as a member of the Armed Services Committee, um, uh, which also looked at the Benghazi attacks, uh, I'm concerned that the interagency cooperation between state and DOD was not sufficient in the weeks and months leading up to the September 11, uh, 2012 attacks. For example, the joint contingency planning and training exercises, if we had conducted any joint interagency planning and training exercises, this may have actually helped the state and DOD to identify and fix existing vulnerabilities in the temporary mission facility in Benghazi. Moreover, regular communications between AFRICOM, which is the DOD command, and the special mission Benghazi could have facilitated the prepositioning of military assets in a region where there were very real questions over the host country's ability to protect our diplomatic personnel. Secretary Clinton, within the weeks of the ter terrorist attacks in Benghazi happening, following that, um, I understand you partnered with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to establish and deploy five interagency security assessment teams um, to assess our security posture and needs at at least the 19 high threat posts um, in 13 different countries. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Deputy Secretary Nides testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee in December of 2012 that the State Department and DOD ISAT initiative created a roadmap for addressing emerging security challenges. Um, why did you partner with the Department of Defense to conduct such a high priority review, and was it effective in addressing the shortfalls in Benghazi and applying it for other locations? <laughs> Congressman, thank, Congresswoman, thank you very much, and thanks for your service and particularly uh, your knowledge about these issues arising uh, from your own military service and the service on the committees here in the House. Um, 
it, it's very challenging um, to get military assets into countries that don't want them there. And in fact, that has been a constant um, issue that we have worked between the State Department and the Department of Defense. Uh, the Libyans made it very clear from the very beginning they did not want any American military or any foreign military at all in uh, their uh, country. And what I uh, concluded is that we needed to have these assessments because even if we couldn't post our own military in the country, we needed to have a faster reaction. Now, I certainly agree 100 percent with the findings of the Armed Services Committee here in the House and other investigations. Um, our military did everything they could. They turned over every rock. They tried to deploy as best they could to try to get to Benghazi. It was beyond uh, the geographic range. They didn't have assets nearby because we don't have a lot of installations and uh, military personnel that are um, in that immediate region. So following uh, what happened in Benghazi, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dempsey, and I agreed to send out mixed teams of uh, our diplomatic security and their um, top security experts from the Defense Department to get a better idea of the 19 high threat posts. And that's exactly what we did. And it gave us some guidance to try to have better planning ahead of time. I know Admiral Mullen testified that it would be beyond the scope of our military to be able to provide immediate reaction to 270 posts. But that's why we tried to narrow down. And of course, we do get help from our military in war zones. The military has been incredibly supportive of our embassy in Kabul and our embassy uh, in Baghdad. But we have a lot of hot spots now and very dangerous places that are not in military conflict areas where we have American military presence. So we wanted to figure out how we could get more quickly a fast reaction team to try to help uh, prevent uh, what happened in Benghazi. Thank you. So um, the, this ISAT process that the joint teams of DOD and state that goes out and initially looked at the 19 uh, posts, um, that's great that they come up back with a report. It's kind of like, you know, the seven reports to this and now we have another committee. We can keep having committees uh, to look into Benghazi, but if we never act on them, it doesn't help our, our men and women on the ground. And that's what I'm focused on. Um, so what I want to know is with these ISATs, so when they came back with their recommendations to you, um, have they been resourced? Uh, are they institutionalized? Is, what has d been done with this process so that it's not a snapshot in time in reaction to Benghazi attack? Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, at the very least, we're continuing the cooperation, or at least there's some sort of inst institutionalization of the review process to make sure that if it's not those 19 posts, if, if the shift now is there's 20 posts or t some other right. posts, w what has been done to make sure it's institutionalized? Well, th that was one of the changes that uh, I instituted before I left, and I'm confident that Secretary Kerry and his uh, counterpart, uh, Secretary Carter at the Defense Department, are continuing that because I think it was very useful. Um, certainly it was useful for uh, our security professionals and our uh, diplomats to be partnered in that way with the Defense Department. You know, historically, the only presence at some of uh, our uh, facilities has been Marines. And as you know well, Marines were there not for the purpose of personnel protection. They were there to destroy classified material and equipment. Um, and so part of the challenge that we have faced in some of these hotspot uh, dangerous areas is how we get more of a presence. And after Benghazi, we were able to get Marines deployed to Tripoli. Um, so this is a constant um, effort between the State Department and the Defense Department, but it's my strong belief that the ISAT process has been and should be institutionalized, and we should keep learning from it. Um, I'd like to touch on the quadrennial uh, reviews. Again, coming from Armed Services, uh, even as a, as a young platoon leader uh, out 
in, in, you know, in a platoon, uh, we got and read the Defense Quadrennial Review, which is, an, which is a, a, a review that happens on a periodic basis, that gives the individual soldier um, an idea of what, what the Defense Department is trying to do. And I understand you, you initiated something similar in right. the State Department. Um, uh, and, and this goes to, there's been discussion already about the culture at the State Department, especially when it comes to security. Um, I find, I find that the De Department of Defense Coordinator Defense Review is very good at instilling culture throughout the department. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how um, and why you decided to do and, uh, the, the review for the State Department? Was it useful? Is it useful? Is it getting out there? Um, is it a, wa a waste of time and we shouldn't be wasting money on it and we should be doing something else? Well, I hope it's not the latter. Um, I learned about the Quadrennial Defense Review serving on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate uh, during my time there. I agree with you completely, Congresswoman. It's a very successful uh, roadmap uh, as to where we should be going, and I'm impressed that as a platoon leader, it was something that you took into account. So when I came to the State Department, there had never been anything like this done. There was no roadmap, and the State Department, USAID, would come up and fight for the money that they could get out of Congress, no matter who was in charge of the Congress, every single year. Uh, it's 1 percent of the entire budget, and it was very difficult to explain uh, effectively what it is we were trying to achieve. So I did institute the first ever quadrennial uh, diplomacy and development review. And one of the key questions that we were addressing is what is this balance between risk and reward when it comes to our diplomats and our development uh, professionals? Because the first thing I heard when I got to the State Department was a litany of complaints from a lot of our most experienced diplomats that they were being hamstrung that the security requirements were so intense that they were basically unable to do their jobs. And of course, then from the security professionals, uh, who were all part of this, uh, what we call the QDDR, they were saying, we don't want you to go beyond the fence. We, we can't protect you in all of these d dangerous circumstances. How you balance that, and it is a constant balancing of risk and reward in terms of what we hope our diplomats and development professionals can do. So it's been done twice now. Secretary Kerry, uh, in his tenure, has uh, done the second uh, QDDR, and I hope it becomes as important and as much of a roadmap as the QDR has uh, for our Defense Department and our military um, services. Thank you. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady from Illinois. The chair will now recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Roby. Good morning. Good morning. Secretary Clinton, my colleagues have focused on your relationship with the Ambassador Chris Stevens uh, and why you sent him into Benghazi in 2011 as part of your broader Libya initiative. Um, but it's not so clear from everything that we've reviewed um, that you had a vision in Benghazi um, going forward into 2012 and beyond. Um, it appears that there was confusion and uncertainty within your own department about Libya. And quite frankly, Secretary Clinton, it appears that you were a, a large cause of that uncertainty. And um, we've seen all the day-to-day -day updates and concern early in 2011. Uh, and I heard what you said to my colleague, uh, Mrs. Brooks, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but showing that Libya, and for that matter, Benghazi,